take the matter of minutes first. Any corrections or additions to the minutes? I have a motion to accept, please. I move. Will we accept Second. Them? That seconds. All in favor? So moved. Uh, we do have some correspondence. We have a letter from R.V. Craig regarding alternative energy. Uh, a member from CEO regarding Eastman Meadows. A letter from D. Tureski regarding Eastman Meadows. And a memo from the Conservation Committee regarding the Moskowitz McMullen um, remedy plan. Um, if the, I would like to say at the beginning of the meeting that we are going to miss Jack Keneally as a member of the planning board. He's been elected to the school board. And you're going to be sorry because we're a f an interesting group I of know. people. <laughs> I'd like to say. And fun. I'd like to say I'm going to miss this board very much too. Yeah. No. But thank you for your service, Jack. And come and see us sometimes or turn well, on your television if you want an exciting evening. Watch us for old time's sake. Right. <laughs> okay. Uh, first matter of business is the Mas Masco Moskowitz McMullen Resource Protection Permit. And Mr. Danielson, will you come up and present to us? Yes, please. Identify yourself first. Okay. Great. Uh, my name is Bob Danielson. I'm an attorney in town in Portland, and I represent Scott McMullen and Diane Maskowitz. And with me tonight is Cole Peters. Cole is a wetlands scientist with TRC in Portland. How do you want me to proceed? Do you want to introduce this? Do you want me to introduce No, it? no, you please introduce it okay. and explain what the mitigation plan is. You can okay. do it fairly briefly, but yep. Yep, just for people who might be watching. Okay, I'll be very brief, but I'll, I'll hopefully be com comprehensive and complete. Uh, the McMullins are requesting an after-the-fact resource protection permit for filling in 4,191 square feet of wetland in an RP2 district. Uh, technically, the property is not zoned RP2, but has characteristics of an RP2, so the code enforcement officer exercised jurisdiction as an RP2 and issued a notice of violation on January 18th of 2007. Uh, by way of history, the house was constructed on this property in 1999 pursuant to a building permit. A uh, certificate of occupancy was issued in 2000 subject to some final completion of landscaping. <coughs> the house was sold to a Jill and John Karen in the year 2000, and in 2004 it was sold to the McMullins. In, uh, as I mentioned, in January of 2007, a notice of violation was issued by the code enforcement officer for the unauthorized filling of a wetland. This filling, it appears, and no one seems to know quite facts appears to have occurred in the year 2000 according to two plans a 1999 Sebago Technics plan of the property showing where the wetlands were and a 2006 plan prepared by Al Frick. Um, what Cole Peters has done is he's uh, superimposed one plan on top of the other and I think you have that in your package as well. Um, we had two choices at that point. We could fight the notice of violation uh, as, a, uh, as to whether it was a violation or not, or we could apply for an after-the-fact permit. The McMullins chose to apply for an after-the-fact permit, and I believe this came before the planning board on May 15th. It was referred to the Conservation Commission. Um, I met with the Conservation Commission on both, in fact, Cole and I, on both July 14th and August 21st. There's a reference in your materials to an August 14th meeting of the Conservation Commission. I think that actually occurred on August 21st. In any event, um, as a proposal to gain an after-the-fact permit, we submitted a mitigation plan uh, which was reviewed and I believe, well, which was approved by the Conservation Commission in its recommendation to this board for the issuance of the permit. What I'd like to do now is turn it over to Cole Peters so that he can tell you more about the specifics of the mitigation plan. Thank you. The <clears throat> mitigation plan that I have here to display to you. This is in your packet. And, um, 
time just for a quick orientation. There's Pickett Street up front, and the, we just call it Young Lane that runs down the northern side of the, the property. Um, the house is located in the front, overlooking Pickett Street, in an area that had been identified as wetland in the past. Uh, one of the earliest plans occurs at the rear of the house. What is shown in blue is the area that remains as a result of how bricks were. And with respect to the area of wetland fill that had occurred, um, we nearly doubled that in size to the rear of the property um, to compensate that loss of wetland. The, the reasoning for selecting this location uh, are, are several, actually. One, it's, it's located on site, and customarily on site is preferential for wetland compensation under other jurisdictions, such as the Corps of Engineers and DDP. In addition, uh, it's, it's within the same watershed, and uh, hydrology or surface water actually flows into this area, and that is the driving force of what makes it exist and, and what is necessary for it to sustain itself. In terms of the, the species that were selected, a grand total of 100 different shrubs are proposed to be planted in this area of four different um, types, and they are selected based on their uh, wildlife habitat value. Most likely, uh, a wetland of this nature, um, what would have existed there in the past, as we can tell from aerial photographs, might be something like speckled auger, which is very pervasive throughout the state of Maine. It does have some habitat value, but in contrast, uh, it lacks many of the attributes of the species that were selected. Those include black chokeberry, which has a nice berry uh, for wildlife at this time of year. Uh, silky duck, which also is very tolerant of wild conditions and recognized as a habitat plant for many different species. Uh, winter bear colony, which we see very prominently at this time of the year, the nice white red berries along the road. And then arrowwood, uh, another wetland shrub. Uh, all of these tolerating wetland conditions, weather conditions, so that in this location, uh, when planted at a density of about 10 feet, uh, 10 feet on center, uh, it will establish a, a thicket in this area, offsetting the, the wetland area that was lost by nearly twice. Attributes of that that can be expected are certainly as well as habitat value, and um, it will provide a, a uh, transition to a forested community in this location. So that's the, the, the nature of the uh, compensation area. Underneath the plan are photographs that uh, display it now. Uh, number one looking this way, number two looking to the west, and photo three looking along the location of the culvert that contributes surface water to the wetland area. So that is the, the nature of the wetland compensation being proposed. Thank you very much. Any comments? Um, We're available for the board uh, for questions and um, I saw the memorandum that Maureen was kind enough to supply me for the uh, potential approval, and if the board decides to approve, I'd like to really discuss the conditions because I have some very deep concerns with some of them. Yes, if I may, um, I'm reminded from what Bob just mentioned as to uh, something I should have mentioned earlier with respect to the 100 plants to be planted. Um, they will be on the order of 18 to 24 inches high. Uh, at other wetland sites throughout the state, and as recently as only two weeks ago, I took part in planting 600 plants of that size. And by way of example, <clears throat> they might come in a container or something like this, so that uh, installation of the plants is very simple. It would be done with a hand spade, merely digging a hole, and then uh, 
placing it in the ground and stomping it uh, with, with the feet so that it has a secure hold. Uh, as a result, uh, I actually, um, in consideration of the potential disturbance this might make and, and simply making use of the area of the hold, uh, it's only about 81 square feet over an area of 8,000. So that when placed at 10 feet on the center, uh, these, uh, these uh, plantings would be rather like uh, the intersection of lines on a volleyball net and not a very extensive area with respect to exposing soil or any vulnerability to erosion. Thank you. Thank you. That's good. That was actually, the question I have was about erosion, so that's good to hear. Okay, well, we're supposed to call a public hearing. I don't think we're going to have too many people stepping forward, but we'll call the public hearing. Seeing nobody, we'll close the public hearing and continue with the planning board asking questions. And, and you also, Bob, you want to come forward and, and talk about the, um, con the, some of the questions that you have about the memorandum? And then we can talk about that too. Uh, yes, the the only concerns I have are the um, conditions of approval that were proposed in the memorandum, and specifically there were five. And the first one uh, was erosion control. Uh, there was a reference that the plan be revised to describe erosion control and. I don't think there is going to be any erosion on this type of planting, so therefore we'd like to have that waived uh, if that's possible. Uh, the second one deals with a performance guarantee. It's my understanding that the cost of these plantings is going to be about $20 a piece for 100 plants, which comes to about $2,000. And uh, the, as I believe the board knows, the applicant was not the one who um, was responsible for the filling. The applicant is the property owner and by Maine law has absolute liability because they're the property owner and I believe a performance guarantee would be another kind of slap in the face on this one. Um, the applicant actually brought the petition, spent money on legal fees and engineering fees and developing the plan and will pay for the plantings, etc. Uh, so we're asking that the uh, performance guarantee be waived as well. Um, Bob, just a quick yes. question on that. Technically, there's still a notice of violation hanging out there, correct? Yes, there is. So yes, there is. Performance um, guarantee over and above a current notice of violation, I and mean, that's not going to be pulled till the work's done. Is that right, Maureen? Do I, is that usually how the sequence works? Well, I think, I think the permit, the issuance of the permit, will remove the notice of violation because it's one of the cures okay. under the notice of violation. Am I right, Maureen? I'm going to answer your question first. <laughs> The performance guarantee was a recommendation of the Conservation Commission. And the reason they recommended it is because they have been very frustrated with these types of violations in the past and the inability to actually correct the violation. We still have some existing violations out there that are several years old now that have out, never out been there in, in town. out there in town. Not, not on this site. Not on this particular this site. Time. And their, their frustration level with sure. the, um, the intent to correct violation versus the actual correction of the violation has uh, driven them to the point where they've said, look, we, we obviously what we're doing now, which is you know, requiring the plan, the planning board requires things to be done and the violation being lifted, right. that doesn't seem to be working Right. Perfectly, and maybe right. we need to try something new. Who, uh, Bob, who's going to actually plant the plantings? Well, thank you. Who's going to plant them? Uh, most likely the nursery that supplies them. Uh, in the past, uh, one that's been made use of is Pearson's Nursery. Um, they, they have a reputation for definitely having uh, wetland species, and I would work with them on numerous occasions, uh, not leaving the holes, but taking part in placing the plants in locations that are best suited, and I've always found them very responsive to get things done. So would the, the $2,000 cover the plantings and, and, and the planting itself, or just the plantings? Both. 
Scott, I missed your, did you ask whether or not that there is any guarantee by the company that plants them? No, I didn't. Okay. <laughs> it's a good question, though. Is there a, is there a one-year warranty or something like that? Uh, that's, that's a standard practice of nurseries, and another requirement of your ordinance is to monitor um, and the condition of the leaders for two years, and that is the purpose of the monitoring, to make sure that there is survival and that <clears throat> but they do warrant them for a year, the plants. Yes. This company. Yeah. And if at the end of the first year, um, you know, mortality is detected, uh, the recommendation of the monitoring report would be to replace the species or the, the number of plants that need to be replaced. So that, that's one of the reasons for a monitoring report. Thank you. Uh, my, my next comment may help on this comment as well because number three deals with a monitoring process by the code enforcement officer and all I'd ask is that it be clarified so that we submit annually for two years uh, whatever uh, the status of the mitigation plan and again that would be enforcement and follow-up obviously if we're not submitting the uh, requirements at the end of the first year or the second year that we would be in violation of the permit as well so that could also be some kind of enforcement uh, as opposed to making the McMillans pay for the sins of others uh, with a performance guarantee. Uh, number four deals with something attached to the deed. I guess I don't understand that one. I, I think what you're referring to is something on, on record. And I don't know, are resource protection permits typically recorded? No, they're not typically recorded. And what the Conservation Commission, they, they didn't come out with a specific deed restriction or easement, they left it up to the board to handle it, but they wanted something in, in the deed for the lot so that a future or a current or future homeowner wouldn't go into this site where you've planted all this mitigation and mow it down in the future. Oh, on, on because of what we're doing in the back. Yeah, yeah so it, is, this, is this area going to be put in conservation? That's the, right now there's nothing proposed. Right. And that the suggestion from the Conservation Commission was to do something to kind of lock in that, that for this current owner and for future owners, that this area is supposed to be left in a natural state, wildlife habitat. Right. You know, there's an intent that goes along with the board approval. But the, the normal procedure in an RP2 approval, resource protection permit would be if I just had a lot and I needed the permit to pull that put a house up mm -hmm. is that permit typically recorded in the title chain it depends I mean if, if the typical resource protection permit is a driveway crossing right. and in those cases you know the like applicant you you alter a thousand two thousand square feet you put in your erosion control and you know, you, you, you have no record of ever violating the ordinance prior to this, right. and you, you go in and, and you rely on enforcement to make sure that you don't go any further than what you've already shown. Sure. Um, in this case, you know, obviously there's a record of things having happened that shouldn't have happened. Right. But that notice of violation isn't in the title chain. It's back. No. If, if I may clarify as well, um, I do a significant amount of title work and I rarely, if ever, see local permits recorded. And also, I don't want the McMullins to be singled out for any particular purpose, because I think this may have a chilling effect on potential sales, but the town records are going to be full of information and the permit on this. And I don't think putting it on the record is going to prevent anyone from mowing it. If they're going to want to mow it, they're going to mow it. Um, they would then be in violation, because they're supposed to look at the records of the town hall and determine whether there's anything on there. So we're looking at an enforcement action, and some of the uh, recommendations I think are a little draconian given the fact that the people came forward and right. are making good on everything else. And my only other comment is um, there's a requirement number five that there be no building permit for two years, um, or at least until the plan is complete. The McMullins never asked for a building permit. They've never requested one in connection with this. I think that would be more appropriate in the event of new construction and if someone were to say, gee, you, you can't put a building permit out there until you finish the remediation or driveway crossing or all that. Um, 
I don't understand why they wouldn't be entitled to a building permit if they want to put an addition on their house or anything like that. I just, it doesn't seem appropriate to me. May I respond to that? Chair. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes, go right ahead. Um, proposed condition number five is the standard condition right. that the board places on all approvals just to make sure that all the prior conditions are addressed through plan revisions before an applicant goes on the site and does the work. Yeah, I think uh, you may be overstating what the restriction is. All it says is you can't get a permit until you, you give us what the conditions are right. that was granted the approval. It's not the work itself. In other words, so starting with number one, until you revise the plans and give them to the town planning, you're not going to get your building permit. We want to make sure that you do what you're supposed to, but it doesn't incorporate the substance of the remedial work. If that can be either clarified right. or through and that's the meeting, that's fine with me. That, that's okay. I just thought that it's no. said No, it says it says issue to building until the plans and materials have been revised to comply with the above conditions and submitted to the town planner. It doesn't say the work. And that's, I just, that's the way I understood it when I read it, and that's the standard hook. I we just, we I keep just read it too conservatively. <laughs> Fair enough. Thank you. That's all I have. Questions from the board and um, discussion of some of the concerns about. I have a couple of questions from Maureen. Uh, when I read the Conservation Commission's memo, I, I, it said. Uh, at the very end, contingent upon implementation of a mitigation plan, which we have in front of us, and then it says appropriate measures for enforcement of the mitigation plan, which, of course, when I first read that, I didn't know what they were talking about until I read the proposed uh, uh, motion. <clears throat> and um, so, but you mentioned specifically, Maureen, that the board at the Conservation Commission specifically asked for performance guarantee, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, Wetland, the professional wetland scientist monitoring, and then the recording. Is that is that right? I'm no. What, tell, tell what they that. what they I mean, the, I need to make it clear. The conservation sure. commission agonized over this. Sure. They held extra meetings to try to handle it. Um, they were very frustrated with the situation. They tried to. Um, it was there was no way. I think it's fair to say that there were, you would have received a negative recommendation from the Conservation Commission if the applicant had not prepared a mitigation plan. Well, sure. They originally approached the Conservation Commission without a mitigation plan, and after a long, um, passionate discussion, uh, were made, it was clear that there was no way they would come forward. So the mitigation plan made a huge difference to the Conservation Commission, in addition to the other factors. They tried very hard to distinguish this, this particular project from any other project. They have very serious issues with after-the-fact permits. Um, so they were willing to consider this under these particular unique <laughs> circumstances, but it was absolutely paramount to them that the mitigation plan actually happen. And, you know, the, the, our record in the past with people going into wetland areas and not even putting anything in, but just leaving them alone so they could revegetate on their own. Right. Um, our, our record has not been great. So they stopped short of telling the board how to accomplish this because they said the planning board can figure it out. But what they said is they, they absolutely are committed to making sure the mitigation plan happens and that it's, it's going to be enforced. And the typical way the board does this, and that's what I try to do, is sure. translate this into proposed conditions. Certainly the board can, you know, eliminate these conditions, can change them, can propose new conditions, but the usual enforcement mechanism that the board uses is they require a professional to go out and do inspections, and they require a monetary guarantee by an applicant, because while the town holds the guarantee, there's a lot more incentive to actually do the work that's been approved. Well, and, and, and Bob, are we, are we talk, talking a total amount of work of $2,000? I mean, what's, what's the scale? And, and my experience with these smaller performance guarantees is they're typically a cash bond, you know, 
You well, that, we then, don't, yeah, we don't accept the, a bond. We would accept an escrow account or a letter of credit. I would assume this size, an escrow account would make a lot more sense. Well, and that the release would be sort of like, almost like a bank release where, well, and, and, I, and I, I'm just trying to walk through the, the procedure so I can understand what kind of impact it has. But go ahead. We'd have no problem with the escrow account if we could draw against it after right. we get bills. I don't, I don't have any problem putting up Typ the money. I just don't want to put up the money twice. Yeah, but the right. escrow accounts that we usually, I mean, the escrow accounts are not drawn on by the applicant. Yes, the escrow accounts are, are how, you know, how do they check comes in, right. we give a letter that says these are the terms of the escrow account, and you do a certain amount of work, and right. then you ask for a release of the money after we inspect it and make sure the work has been done. What, My I'm, expectation I'm, is for a project of this size, there would be no release of the funds until the entire project is done. And it's once it's released, it's, I mean, once it's done, you, you request a release, we have someone go out there, they count the plants, they're in place, and it would get released. So I don't see it like a six month release. It's kind of like a week to two week release. Um, but it wouldn't be like you draw on it, and that's not, that's not an escrow account well, the way I, we use it. I understand, but how much, how much is it? It's a one shot bill, and I'm, I'm trying to strike a balance here. Because I do understand it's not fair to make them put it up twice if they can do a simple procedure where they can draw on it without making it an administrative but ridiculousness for the town. Go ahead. Right. But I don't think these plants are going to be planted until the spring. Oh. Got it. Yeah, but assuming a contractor or somebody who wants some money down before they're going to do anything, if you put it all in escrow, then you can't get at it. And like you said, you. I yeah. just. I just feel you like know, I don't want to pay twice, that's all. I, I understand. I, I really feel that we have a situation here that there is no indication that these people did this with any malice or any knowledge that we have received so far. And I think we need to be really careful with how far we ask them to go. I have trouble with the performance guarantee in this situation. I think that we can build something in where they, they go out and they get the plan, and you know, they have the plan now. They come in and they show the bill from the, from the nursery that they purchased the plants and that we have a, a build in that there has to be an inspection of these um, in some way annually as has been requested, but I think to ask them to put up four thousand dollars essentially is is a little bit unfair. And, and have it tied up for six and have it tied up for six or eight months. I just do not feel that that. I think in some situations it's appropriate, and I feel that in this situation that it's beyond the the limits. I really do. That's my personal opinion. The, the next item, Maureen, is the. Um do you have any issue with what the applicant's proposing in terms of the an, just an annual, annual report? Is that what no, you're looking? I think that was the intent. Okay, so yeah, just, we, we're we're in agreement on three then. Mm -hmm. Three is okay. fine. Well, but but I think. Um, and, and four. The, that, that we may want to rephrase it a little bit. That that annually for two years. That'd be fine. And the word uh, annually just needs to. That be we have our. I don't have All right. to use it. Well, you can do it anyway. <laughs> try it the old-fashioned way with the pen and pencil. Uh, I, I usually edit these on my laptop as we go uh, along here. But. And, and you are going to be monitoring the situation as the wetland specialist. So, okay. so number four, the, the question of recording the approval. Um, I mean, my experience is one of the difficulties is a very practical one is it's very very difficult when you see this in the title chain to to get any kind of anything out of the town to sh to show compliance so as a title lawyer i'm completely sympathetic with bob's plight here that um i, I find these all the time you, you take the exception on the policy and you scratch your head and say i hope they did what they were supposed to do out there i mean that's really <laughs> So I'm, I'm not really in favor of recording this particular one, given the given given three things in this case. One, <clears throat> they stepped to the plate. They spent the money with the engineering. They, they, they hired an attorney. They they're obviously committed to getting the job done. Uh, we still have the conditions on the approval. I mean, frankly, um, if they don't do what they're supposed to do, the permit gets pulled, and they were issued another notice of violation, which I truly don't expect. But that's the same enforcement mechanism that we have right now, and and they're in front of us. Well, that does not take care of the contingency of them. Selling the property and a new owner going in and I agree with you completely. That's and my so I only think hesitation. I think something simple, something simple has to be recorded with the deed. Just to let conservation. 
But, but isn't that the case in every single, I mean, we've got wetlands on our property. Don't and it doesn't say in our deed that we have to, that we have those wetlands and if somebody altered them, it would be the same kind of situation. Well, this so. is a mitigation area, not necessarily a wetlands per se itself. So I think that's the reason why it has to be included as part of the deed. Well, there isn't a deed to be filed, is there? No. That's, I mean, part of this is practical. There's no deed to be filed. These people own this property. So what we're talking it's about here to the is deed. another recordable instrument exactly. that goes on there in some form, exactly. putting the public on notice of the mitigation plan. Uh, Cole, for projects of this, well, even larger, where you're creating wetlands for the state of Maine, aren't these lands normally preserved? through some sort of deed restriction? Yes, um, that is customary. Right. Um, I guess what comes to my mind with respect to this particular circumstance is I've, I've never had a case um, of such a small wetland compensation as 8,000 square feet. Um, you know, knowing that, um, you know, it, its purpose is to offset a prior loss. Um, certainly don't want someone to undo that in the future, unawares or wares. What does occur to me about the location of this is that um, it, it lies essentially along the lot line in an area that's designated as the third foot setback. So that based on that location, the requirements of a setback now, it may not be very probable that that area would be um, affected. In contrast to where it's in the center of the lot and someone wanted to add a garage or a play structure or whatever. I've got a more basic question. It may have been answered because I got here a little bit late. But what are these magic plants that are going to make a huge difference in what's going on over there? I mean, I'm, I'm again, I hope you don't have to repeat yourself, but I, I don't get it. The, the plants that I selected are, and these were part of the packet, um, they are recognized for their, one, their upland plants. If, if upland plants were recommended, for instance, Northern Red Oak, in that setting, they probably wouldn't survive because they're, they're just not a wetland species. So one, they're the right plant. Two, um, they're very hardy. Um, they, they don't require a lot of attention. They're not fussy. Um, three, they're a species that um, three of them have fruit that, that wildlife prefers. So the purpose is to uh, provide that, that habitat value and offset that might have been lost for the wetland that was filled. Hmm. Yeah. I don't. I don't. I don't get it. It's kind of hard for me to get excited about the whole thing, I guess. But that's not the point. Um. Well, it, there are different styles of compensation. Um, you know, one is is called creation, um, where you dig a hole and hope that it holds water well enough, and long enough for one of the plants to thrive. Um, you know, that just isn't very fitting to this property, uh, one being the bedrock so close to the surface. Mm -hmm. um, another form is enhancement, uh, planting extra plants to improve or upgrade a wetland. Um, and there just isn't an abundance of wetlands on the property to begin with. Yeah, these things, obviously, they're, they're so close together, they won't ever get very big, right? Well, no, I, I think in, in terms of that space of 10 feet on the center, it, it's very common to go into a wetland find the plants much, much closer right. than that. And it's not as if these are shrubs. Um, their, their life form isn't to turn into a tree or a swamp, but it will become a, a shrub thicket, um, as is very common here in Cape. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, I guess just listening to the board's thoughts and comments, um, Regards to the performance guarantee, you know, the world I live in, performance guarantees are real, and they're there for a purpose. They are the stick. While they may not ultimately be fair in all regards, they're the only means this board has in front of them to ensure that this 
is done and, and is done properly. So I, for one, am in favor of a performance guarantee. Um, if there are certain terms that make it less burdensome for the applicant, so be it. You know, I, you know, I, I think maybe we can be a little creative in that regard. Um, in terms of the deed, um, again, this is, a, this is a wetland that's being created because of an issue. Uh, while it may not have been an issue or probably was not an issue, the applicant uh, did, I think it's important to understand that this wetland needs to be noted and it needs to be to some degree preserved. So again, by whatever means practical, and I'll, I'll leave it to Peter and others to tell me what that is, but by what means practical that can be identified and maintained, again, I, I, I think that's our charge here. We need to make sure that again, five years from now, that just doesn't get mowed over as, 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 as you know, for whatever reason. So I guess I, I stand in a position of one, wanting a performance guarantee, and two, of finding a way that this need to be identified and maintained. I agree. I agree as well. I have a couple other questions. Well, if, if, if the board is, is adamant about a performance guarantee, does it have to be in an amount equal to the $2,000 to tie up? And at least it should be in an interest-bearing account, whatever it is. They, they are in interest-bearing accounts. And the applicant gets it back. I mean, they don't oh, I know the applicant advice. gets it back. Just, but. You know, the, <clears throat> the way this is going with these different conditions, I mean, like, do we want to put this in a package or do we want to vote on each condition at a time? Uh, let, me, let me comment. I, I understand what, where Bob's coming from when he talks about the assuming to be an onerous set of conditions. And if I were in Bob's shoes or in the, his client's shoes, I'd feel the same way. On the other hand, given the nature of the approval by the Conservation Commission, I believe they're appropriate for the situation we have at hand here. Yeah, but but, but uh, Jack, he's, it's not like the applicant's saying, you know, I'm you know, taking off to Tahiti. They're stepping to the plate. They're getting the job done. And I understand, and we have other things to ensure compliance. I mean, I, to me, the, the performance guarantee is the one I'd drop and, and work with the other four to move forward with this. I mean, in terms of the title record, I can, you know, it'd be easier for the applicant to live with it being recorded than to, to put up some more money. And, and in my thought, Maureen, and this is a question, because five doesn't really fit the standard scenario. And I, my thought in terms of, of, the, of the language would be that there would be no withdrawal of the notice of violation until the plans and, and materials have been submitted to comply with the above conditions. And that are, you, are you assuming you're not going to require any erosion control information? Because erosion control is a standard of the resource protection permit and there's been nothing submitted. I mean, the applicant could do as little as write a letter describing what Mr. Peters described today so that we at least had some basis for you making a finding that there, there won't be erosion control. But well, it's just that nothing's been submitted. I see what you're I saying. You mean number, tying number one and five together, it says the plans and materials be revised to describe erosion control measures. You're saying we need to specify that in a little more detail today if we're going to tie I, those together. What, what I said is, you know, well, what, how does when, when I draft you an emotion, I, I, I like to be able to point to the record to show that you've addressed each of the standards. <laughs> and I tried really hard, and I just couldn't find anything on erosion control. Okay. That's why that, it's not that I have a huge concern that there's going to be an erosion control situation. There's just nothing in the record. But even on five, I'm not saying withdraw completely. I'm saying, yeah. what, what, what is adding alteration of the site or issuance of the building permit? How does that help? I'm saying, let's hold back the notice, the violation withdrawal until we get the erosion control measures that we want. And if there is any, um, Thing not clear about what we're doing. Let's let's it's, figure out what, see, what they're supposed to be doing. You, as a planning board, have n no control over the notice of violation. Right. I mean, the authority over that is with the code enforcement officer. Well, Bobby made a comment that it's it gets with, once the permit's issued. But the, the, but the, the violation planning board itself, has nothing to do with that. I understand. Yeah. That makes sense. Violation itself says it will be removed upon issuance of an after the fact permit. Okay. So you're saying by its own terms, it's going to yes. go away. Yes. And, and Paul has a point about the erosion. Sure. When I saw the condition recommending erosion control, uh, when I think of erosion control, uh, I think of things like silt fence, staked hay bales, ground up uh, bark chips, um, they call erosion control mix. And, you know, in, in thinking of 100 plants uh, with holes that big in diameter on a flat surface, uh, where 
you know, there's not steep surrounding slopes and those holes are interspersed like I described uh, the, the lines of a, a net. I just didn't see vulnerability relative to erosion. Now, if that is a sort of standard condition, uh, and you know, I, I think that what could easily be done, uh, and it would qualify as erosion control uh, as part of the planting, to merely put mulch around the plant for a diameter of six inches or eight inches, whatever, and there would be no exposed soil that could be at all vulnerable to erosion. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I thought in the initial presentation, one of you mentioned that water does flow across this area. It, it does, but you know, it, it, it is not at any sort of velocity. Uh, there, it's a flat surface, it's low lying, uh, but you know, for erosion to take place, there, there needs to be exposed soils, which there will not be, or water of a sufficient velocity to, to remove soil, and there's just not that threat. Um, you know, some of the most common wetlands throughout the state of Maine are in flat hay fields, and that's very similar to, to what exists here. So I, I just, while the, the board's concerns for every single project are well-founded, here is a circumstance where I, I don't think that threat exists. Okay, thank you. I was not clear until you said that, that it was a relative flat area. I thought when you said water flowed across it, okay. that it was at a substantial grade. No. Sorry. Mr. Peters, I apologize if I missed it, but in, in any of the submissions to the board, did you describe digging up a hole and putting the plant in and then stomping it in like you described tonight? No, I mean, that's just a, a standard practice. Right, but when I was reading the mitigation plan, I had assumed someone was going to go in there and clear out what was there right now no. and then put in the new plants. And then if you didn't put mulch in, obviously you would have a potential erosion control problem. I guess what I'm suggesting is saving your client the cost of buying the mulch and instead just writing a letter that meets this condition that describes what you've just described tonight. And then conclude that using that particular installation technique, there won't be an erosion. That can be done. And I think that's all that needs to be added because actually the placement of mulch is mentioned in the last sentence of a paragraph on the second page of your letter. Placement of woody mulch to a diameter of 12 inches around the plantings. You have is also recommended to improve establishment by maintaining soil moisture and control of competition by weeds. It's already in front of us. So, right, so if the mulch is already there, and I'm assuming, I mean, I've planted these plants, so I know what they are. That mulch will serve to cover the exposed soil as well. And, and I just... The addition to that, I mean, a sentence there, yeah. I, I mean, think, would solve yeah. this issue. Yes. Don't you think? I do. Yeah. I mean, as you said, you, you've planted plants like these. Yeah. And it's not as if one would use a backhoe or any type of tract equipment. No. A yeah, spade, it would be maybe. Precisely. Yeah. yeah. So my thought is, and, and I, I know all these plants, I actually have them on my property. If he added simply another phrase to that sentence, that said it would maintain soil moisture, control competition by weeds, and prevent any erosion for, of exposed soil. I think that does it. In my opinion, it does it. Yeah. Is everybody happy with the forward addition? Yeah, I go along with that. Uh, well, I, what's, if we end up recording this um, approval and plan, what actually gets recorded? Is it this plan, the 11 by 17 plan, or is it, uh, what is it, Maureen? It's up to you. I mean, I, I, you know, you is could, I mean, there's a whole range of things you could do. I mean, there could actually be a conservation easement written with a meets and bounds description of this no, area. No. I mean, you, you could say, okay, we want you to um, approve the planning board decision with the plan. I mean, that, that's the least amount of paperwork. And it's then tied to the, I mean, at least anyone purchasing the property in the future would do title search and find that, understand that this is something that has to stay there. There's a range of things you can do. Uh, another option then would be to just put a sentence on the plan itself to say how the plants 
are to be planted and mulched versus amending a letter that's that's another way to that's why we have that condition number five at the end that says plans right. and materials be revised because you know there's different there's often different ways to meet a condition and the idea is to bring the plans that we have on file in the office um, make them reflect what the board has voted on tonight my concern about putting something on the plan and recording it about mulching plants if you get a really i mean i was a title lawyer for a while if you get a really persnickety title lawyer who starts saying that they won't issue title insurance because they have no evidence that there's the right kind of mulch there, yeah. and it's a possibility, it really is. I, I really hate to burden these folks with potential problems if they ever decide to sell this property or any other buyer or seller of the property. Um, I do too. I think there are limits to how far we should. You know, on the other hand, I, I think having some notice so that that doesn't get ripped up and mowed down you know, and somebody doesn't put a and that playground would, in And that notice. would be my preference versus a performance bond. What, you know, my what, view is we're concerned about this staying the way it's supposed to stay, these folks, and in the future. You know, and, and why penalize them monetarily now? They've stepped to the plate. They're here in front of us. They spent all this money. Forget the money. But, but I guess my advice would be of you know, the two, put it on the record so that you got a plan. You know, I mean, I guess I, I do understand Beth's concern about a persnickety, you know, hold up here, but I guess I look at this and say this is so basic, it's probably going to be fine, but I do see recording it as, as, our, as our stick rather than the money. Well, what about just recording what, the plan? What, what about recording a notice that refers to yes. the town file? Yeah, I was the plan. Uh, clearly, I think you need that, but you're saying instead of the plan? Instead of the plan. That's, that's fine with me. Well, this is all on file for the property, right? So. Well, when you, you just want it in the title chain, so it, yeah. it picks up in the index. No, I mean, that's what I mean. The notice would, yeah. would pick it up, and they'd, anybody would be put on notice that there's, there's information There's something out there the you title. need to pay attention to. Yeah. I, I think that's the best way. My suggestion is we do it the simplest way for the owners as possible. I think the effectiveness is going to depend, if you do it that way, very greatly on what that notice actually says, too. Well, what is wrong with recording the plan, though? Yeah, we're just, I mean, is that a problem, just recording this plan? No, as long as we don't have any conditions on No, just this plan. plan. That says, this is a, you know, it says clearly, this is a wetland compensation plan. Right. And. No, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I don't think it's going to be an issue. I mean, it, Peter? No, I'm fine with that. Well, I'm, I'm ready for a motion. <laughs> Good. I, I, I'm not. Oh, OK. <laughs> 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 this uh, plan says that the planting is going to be done in September. Oh, and, too late. Um, my guess is that you are hoping to do this work this fall at one time, or are you planning on doing it next fall? Because you describe the reasons why you'd like to do it in the fall. Yeah. Um, well, the plan's dated July, so yeah. I was assuming you made it two months ago. The, the, initially, the, the hope was to have these in the ground already and be well on the way. Uh, but um, I, I, in terms of planting, um, it certainly can be done in the spring. I, I have a project where we are looking to plant uh, even this week. So uh, given the mild winter, uh, or the delayed winter, I should say, it's not out of the question to uh, do it this fall. Um, next spring, uh, there's no problem with planting then either. And, you know, as to the September suggestion, that was merely because it was put together in July, right? Would, um, if they were, if they could, and I don't know if they can, if they could plant them immediately, is there any danger that the roots will be damaged be if, if suddenly there's a frost within a week or two? I, I don't think with the, the, where, how deeply they'll be buried below ground and mulch on top, I, I don't think that's an issue. Because we need to put something in about when they'll be. This has to be redated and re. Um, that would have to be changed. Those words in there about when they're planted. But I. That if you tell us they could plant them right away, then if it's approved tonight, or if you want to leave it the spring. I don't as long know. as it doesn't snow. <laughs> 
Anybody have any other questions they want to ask? Peter, do you want to read the or do we have a motion for the board to consider? Yes. <laughs> I have a motion for the board to consider. Uh, I move that we make the following findings a fact. Uh, number oh. one, you ready, Barbara? Yeah, I had another question to ask, and that is, does anybody here feel like we need a site walk because we're supposed to? I don't. I don't. No. Okay, fine. Go ahead, Peter. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, one, Diane Maskowitz and Scott McMullen are requesting an after-the-fact resource protection permit to fill 4,191 square feet of wetland and pond for landscaping located at 221 Fickett Street, which requires review under Section 19-8-3, comma, resource protection regulations. Two, the Conservation Commission has reviewed the application and endorsed issuance of a permit as long as implementation and enforcement of the mitigation plan are required. Three, the mitigation plan will require vegetation removal and soil disturbance that could result in soil erosion if the area is not properly stabilized. Four, the application substantially complies with section 19-8-3 comma resource protection regulations. Therefore, I move that based on the application and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Diane Maskowitz and Scott McMullen for an after-the-fact resource protection permit to fill 4,191 square feet of wetland and pond for landscaping located at 221 Fickett Street be approved subject to the following conditions. That the plans and materials be revised to describe er erosion control measures as stated on the record by the applicant. Two, that for the two years following the implementation of the mitigation plan, the applicant annually submit to the code enforcement officer a report prepared by a professional wetland scientist evaluating the condition of the mitigation area with the approved plan. Three, that the application, applicant record this approval and approved plan in the Cumberland County Registry of Deeds. Four, that there will be no alteration of the site until the plans and materials has, have been revised to comply with the above conditions and submitted to the town planner. That's the end of my motion. I'll second. Discussion? Yeah, I, I'm sitting here stewing over this. Um, I just, in this particular instance, I just disagree with the whole concept. I think it's a waste of money. I think it's a waste of time, our time included. And I don't think it's going to change anything on the site. That's my, that's my opinion. I just wanted to state that. And I don't want to hold up the vote. So. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay. <clears throat> All in favor of the um, motion, as motion as stated, raise their hand. And against? Abstain. Abstain. Six four, one abstain. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I figure it <laughs> Okay. Uh, <clears throat> other business of the um, small wind energy zoning amendment. We've, we've, some of us have gone to sessions about wind power and we've certainly discussed this. And we have a, um, a draft. Let's talk about changes in the draft or questions about it. Does anybody have any questions about the draft? I, I do have one question that we discussed. Um, under the definition, small wind energy system, the last 
two words, 100 kilowatts, we talked about the fact that 100 kilowatts would power a large commercial wind vane. And I've read information that says the most residential systems, 8 to 10 kilowatts is more than sufficient. But I will defer to, OK. So at least to me, we shouldn't have that in here. We should have a realistic number in here. I would agree. I'd go for 20 kilowatts. 20 kilowatts. Everybody feel that 20 kilowatts. Um, which is more than double the amount that, exactly. that is necessary. I just feel having 100 in here makes it look like we don't know what we're talking about. Can I just ask Jim what he thinks about Jim, does 20 make sense? You know what yes, it does. 20 does? I'm fine with 20. Though. Everybody fine with 20 in there? Okay. Right. I wanted 10 windmills in my yard so I could get up to 100 kW. So. <laughs> Anybody um, have anything else about any of this that they want to discuss? Nobody? No. All right. Yeah. I, yes, go ahead. Okay. Um, on number uh, the uh, standards, section 19 8 13. Uh, I guess got two things. Do we want to be. It's page five. Page five, yes. And, and I guess it would be standard number five. Uh, do we want to be specific and insert maybe the words after soil conditions at the proposed small wind energy system building site? That's one thought I have. Say that in, Scott. I didn't see what Oh, in the fifth line in number five, it says, take into consideration soil conditions at the proposed small wind energy system building site. At the installation site. Installation site, yeah. And then my second, I guess it's more of a question or a comment, we're specific that we want a state of Maine licensed professional engineer to certify the foundation design. And then we say that the, the, the last sentence that the system itself shall be approved by a licensed professional engineer. I know we talked about that, but then I got thinking about it some more and looking at the, um, you know, the sky, the sky stream packet, and I'm not sure what exactly is going to be provided uh, that will be a, an approval by a licensed professional engineer. Is it going to be a spec or uh, a specification drawing, or, or what are we looking for? And is it going to be, and, and does that, it's probably not going to be by a state of Maine engineer, because I don't believe these are manufactured in, in Maine. So I guess it's, it's a question, comment. Do we want to be more specific there? or leave it kind of open-ended? I know one thing, the, a licensed engineer probably won't be the one certifying the soil conditions. It'd be a geotech, I'm assuming, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. So we'd have to be a licensed, I don't know what the proper licensed geotechnical science. Well, the, the licensed professional engineer would take, in the, in, take into consideration soil conditions, which he could get from a... From a geotech. Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, that was the same question I had, Scott. I, 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 my suggestion is maybe just striking the last sentence. I think what, what I've been looking for here is some sort of um, determination by a licensed professional engineer that the foundation holding the system uh, will be adequate and appropriate. So the I, first sentence takes care of that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I believe it does. Yep. I think the second one was related to we don't want somebody just building one in their garage or garage. Um, Garage, from, as we say. From, from scrap or whatever. You want it to be a, you know, one that's, that you buy off the shelf, like Skystream or another. Is that, is that what we're looking for? I had the same question. What, what is being approved? It says the system to be in shops installed shall be approved. Are we, oh. I, I have exactly the same question. Are we? I think, yeah, I think Scott's put his finger on it. It's probably to directed at pre preventing someone building it in their garage. Right. right. You want a company like, you know, S Skystream or another yeah. reputable company, that's, that's, the turb that's the system that's going to be installed. Yeah. Right? Isn't that what we, I think that's what we want. Well, okay, with the last sentence, it doesn't say that someone can't build it in their garage, but then they've got to get someone else to say it's not going to fly apart. R right. <laughs> yeah, but 
So are there we're asking for, for that? approval of what safety? Are there standards for that? Well, that's what well I, ask. What are the standards I mean, you, you're using good engineering principles. You're going to, if they're going to build something, you're going to evaluate whether it will hold up or not under, not under certain conditions. Yeah, but there's, there's no specs you can refer to. Like a like a ASTM standard or yeah. some sort of. Mm -hmm. I don't, but I, well, I shouldn't say that. Yeah, well, I, none of I, I mean, Peter, I'm not an engineer, yeah, but yeah. In, in terms of the ASTM, I mean, I would think that you, if you designed it yourself, you would want to make sure that the monopole was strong enough to hold the weight. So in that, that there's an engineering standard that says, you know, if you've got a turbine and it's flying around, there's going to be some torque involved and there's probably an ASTM. I can't say there'd be a standard. I think there are ways of analyzing right. the design but I would not classify it as an ASTM standard. For example, until recently, you could make your own biodiesel. There was no standard. Um, now there is. Right. But I don't know if that's a good example or not. But um, yeah, I, I, again, I, I, I think the application here is making sure that, you know, even if somebody did build it in the garage, that it was appropriately de designed such that the foundation, the pole, the yeah. You know, assembly of it isn't going to fly apart, and you know, in, in in the first windstorm over 30 miles an hour. Um, so maybe what we're asking for is that the installation be certified by a state of Maine licensed professional engineer. Is that what we're asking for? Well, that's what I just jotted down that the installation. Cert that we have an engineer certify that the installation which is done according to commonly accepted engineering principles or something like that yeah. since we don't have any standards I should say it's designed according to established principles I don't know if you get an engineer as well. will they certify the installation, installation. Yeah. yeah they'll certify the design yeah. um, again this is just for that if you're below the hundred percent right, right. <clears throat> if we're attaching it to five, that's exactly what it's that's for. Exactly what you want to attach it to everything, you need six. No, no, no. No. Mm -hmm. I don't think we do. Not, not intending to do that. I, I, I think it's just certifying the foundation and the, um, what's the word I'm looking for? The system? I mean, Paul's um, concern is this thing was going to fly off the foundation, right? Yeah, I mean, generally what we're, at least again, what I'm looking for is that the foundation and that the pole and the attachment of the turbine to the pole is, you know, stamped by a licensed main PE, and he says, looks good to me. You mean the, the actual pole and the turbine may not be a main PE. It depends where the thing's made. I mean, the foundation, you'd get a main PE to, to, right. to do it. I stamp plans, and those plans are catalog cuts for light poles. I'm ultimately, yeah, I'm, a, I'm ultimately responsible for, for all of those. That's true. So I, so I, I, have, I have no that's trouble true. with that. That's true. Um, if, so if it's from somebody you're familiar with, if the guy's building it in his shed, you're probably yeah. not going to yeah. say enough. That's true. So it is, the, is it the assembly of the equipment that we're talking about? And is it only if it's less than 100 foot setback? It's, it's only if it's less than 100 percent, yeah. That's the only time you're concerned, if it's less than 100 foot setback. Right. Okay. Not, not well, then, then maybe we need to say shall require that the foundation um, and the foundation design and wind energy system. Foundation and equipment. And equipment, or however you'd say it, hmm. be approved. It's too broad. Um, You're saying just take out the last sentence. I think we just take out the, la the last sentence. That means that just the, the foundation, foundation design. Be That's all we're trying approved. to solve with this, Barbara. Right. We're trying to yep. encourage the process I don't know yep. with, the mini with the minimum yep. of, of red tape, but to ensure the safety that, of the neighbors. Yep. Right. If, and that ac this accomplishes that. If there's going to be a weak, weakest link in this, this it's is going to be the going foundation. Be this. So I would, I, again, I, I think striking the last sentence would be appropriate. Mm -hmm. I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. Defer to the engineers and the. Scott, you okay with that? He's concerned about the guy in the shed. Yeah, I am. I hadn't thought about the guy in the shed. Well, there are a lot of those guys in Maine. <laughs> no, I, I. It's true. Well, the question I, is, are there any in Cape Elizabeth? Yeah, I think there, yeah, I think there are. Yeah. I think there are. <laughs> we may have one or two of them sitting right here at this. <laughs> <laughs>
So I just you build an airplane. You know, I don't know. Scott, how would you like to say it? I mean, I, how do you feel it might be covered? And we need a separate one because the guy in the shed could build it even if it's 100 feet. Yeah, he has got enough land, but, but we're less concerned than if it does disintegrate, it's going to hit anyone else. Yeah. They hit his own house. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I mean, so we're not, we're not so concerned about that. What happens if he sells the house to some well, unwitting I... buyer? <laughs> With wetlands that you don't know about. <laughs> <laughs> Buy the property. And don't see the the turbine. The I record it in the red shoes. I, I I have a suggestion for the board. Um, if we modify the is it the actually it's I guess it's still the first sentence. Foundation and wind energy system structure design. To me, that would cover the mm. foundation and the pole. I still can't get out of the guy building it in his garage, but I'm still not sure that we want wind energy. Foundation and wind energy system structure. Yeah, that's a good one. I mean, to, to try to regulate somebody, what somebody builds in their garage, I'm, I don't know if we can go there. Or it would be foundation design. Small, small wind energy system, right? Small wind energy system, right? No, foundation, structure. that doesn't fit there. Right. Structure. Right. Why don't we say wind energy system structure and foundation design taking into consideration soil conditions. At the installation site, comma, be certified. At the installation site, be certified by a state of. Does that make sense? Read that again, please, Barbara. It does. Well, I hope I do. Got it again. I think, I think we can just say foundation and structure design. But then you're talking about soil conditions, and that goes with the foundation structure. So all I'm saying is reverse the, 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 uh, reverse the position of the wording say wind energy system structure and foundation design taking into consideration soil conditions at the installation site comma be certified by a state of maine licensed professional engineer that sounds good that's good is that okay, yep. is that okay? Deleting very yes. and deleting deleting last sentence and deleting last sentence as per paul's recommendation very nice barbara Okay, anything else? Anybody have anything else before we vote on a motion? I, I would like to say one thing in case anybody's listening. Um, I have done some reading about the height of these windmills. Everybody knows I'm concerned about aesthetics, and I still am. Um, I'm happy to, to vote to, to move this on. I have great concern about 100 feet. I understand why, and Jim, I... Oh. Did more reading about it and know that the ground, there's turbulence of wind on the ground. And that when you get up higher beyond the turbulence, then these systems work a lot better. And that the recommendation is a minimum of 80 feet is what I've read in the, mm -hmm. you know, in most of the literature. And we're talking about 100 feet, which isn't that much different. But I remain very concerned about aesthetics. However, I think it's very important that we move this on and that we give the public a chance to respond to what our draft might be and see what kind of concern they might have about aesthetics. Okay. So I, I just wanted to make that clear, how I feel about it. And this is going on to the town council, so there is. Well, no, no. Next step would be uh, we right now we would just vote vote to move forward the changes we've made now in in the in the draft, and that we would schedule a public hearing for our next meeting, because there would essentially be several public hearings about this. But I'm just stating that I am still concerned about the aesthetics, although. As Jim, and in his knowledge, has pointed out to us that really 100 feet should be the minimum height. And Where's I did do extra reading all about Where's 100 feet in there? Where's turbulence. 100 feet in there? <laughs> it's in every district. I mean, if you look yeah, at the last oh. page, Jim, right under li on line 9, page 5, look at line 9, maximum small wind energy system height, all use is 100 feet. I think it's everywhere. I couldn't hear what you said. If you look at the last page, if you look at the last page, page five, line nine, maximum small wind energy system height, all use is 100 feet. We should clarify that it's 100 feet, in my mind, to the center line of the shaft, the rotor of the shaft, not to the top of the blades. But we should clarify that. Because you could take that in different ways. 
But it was in here somewhere. Yeah, we talked about that. And it, we talked about it, but I don't, I, just a quick glance, I didn't see where we said that. Under setbacks, you've actually defined it as to the furthest reach of the blades. Where's that? Um, for example, on page one of the draft, line 32, um, I did not explicitly state that for height. <coughs> I can certainly clarify it, but I think if you want to make it to the center line of the turbine, you may want to think about that for the setback, too, just so we measure it consistently. Yes. Hmm. How big are these blades on this system? Well, they can be minimum. Well, they, they, vary. they vary. They vary. They vary. That's just it. Um, I agree with Maureen. Just measure it consistently, but pick one and go with it. And I'd say, I'd say both of them should be the center of the turbine. I mean, center of the turbine. Center of the turbine. The rotor. The rotor. Do that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't, we're not dealing with double measurements. Then how high would they be, actually? It'd be higher than a hundred feet. The blade. Mm -hmm. the blade. Just the blade. Yeah. Blade would reach there, so. <laughs> <laughs> what you see is. The, She's shooting me with her eyes. It's the center, you know. <laughs> the darts are I've flying. I've stated I have concerns about aesthetics, but I'm happy to send it on. Where, where did you see your 80 feet? Is it one of these? Oh, there. I, I looked it up on. Um, did it? I Googled wind turbine systems height requirements, and I got all kinds of information. But did it say 80 feet to where? I don't remember, but it talked about turbulence on the ground and mm -hmm. how you have to get up high enough, 200 feet from or something from the nearest obstruction, and that typically 80 feet. It didn't really say. I don't remember it, it saying that, and I, mm -hmm. maybe I have those papers right here because I copied them. No. But I can show. Maureen you. sent us some stuff today, but I'm not sure it was. I didn't get a chance. No, to No, that was the letter. In. No, that wasn't there. Um, I haven't done an, uh, enough. Oh, here's up. something from Mother Earth. I thought that was a pretty reputable publication, <laughs> and here's another one. <laughs> Well, here I can read it. I can read it right now. A wind turbine must have a clear shot at the wind to perform efficiently. Turbulence, with which both reduces performance and works the turbine harder um, than smooth air, is highest close to the ground and diminishes with height. Also, da 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 da. Um, a, A 10 kilowatt turbine will usually need a tower of 80 to 120 feet. We do not recommend mounting wind turbines to small buildings. So that's, to me, that's the tower, and the top of the tower will be very close to the center line of the shaft, because that's where the uh, equipment will be sitting right on top of that, or cantilevered off of it. All right. Well, I tried to, to you know, yeah, but no, I think my you, knowledge. No, you, I mean, you, you, to me, you clarified that because to the, to the top of the structure, and to me, that's the pole. The pole. Okay. Not the blades. Okay, so this would be lower than what you're talking about. What would be? I, I mean, what they've said. Oh, well, yeah, you, you, I mean, they said 80 to 120 feet. 120 feet. I'm splitting the difference, I guess, okay. to not get too many people up in arms. Well, but I, I remain, at, at whatever it is, I remain concerned about aesthetics. Okay. But, but I understand wanting to promote alternative energy, too, so. Anybody have anything else? Are we open to a motion yes. for a public hearing? Sure. I have a motion for the board to consider. Uh, that be it ordered that the planning board will hold a public hearing at its regular meeting on December 18, 2007, to hear comments on proposed, I would say, on, on the, the, the proposed amendment as amended this evening, as changed this evening? As amended, yep. As amended? Understood. To, thank you. To the zoning ordinance that would make small windmills a permitted use. Second. Okay. Um, all in favor? Oh, any discussion? All in favor? <laughs> okay. 
Okay. Um, we have yes. the um, we have the draft memorandum too. And I would yeah I would appreciate it if the board would authorize that to be submitted to the council for the end of this month. Mm -hmm. Oh, the, the draft memorandum. No, we have. Yeah. yeah. You're, you have been asked by the council to provide a report by the end of November, any final report by the end of December. So I've drafted a memo that summarizes everything you've done for tonight, and I'd like you to authorize this to send out under your name. With the attached um, changes? Without the amendments. Oh, okay because you haven't finished with them yet. And then if you, uh, you'll hold a public hearing next, I mean, they've asked for two reports. Right. They've asked for a report at the end of November, and then if you do anything else, you have to do something at the end of December. So, so we'll have another report after our public hearing, right? Yes. Okay. I move that we authorize Maureen to sign I, that draft memo. I second. Okay. Okay, I'll answer it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Mark. Sorry, Mark. All right. Throw something. I, I don't mind a little help. Peter. I'm trying to move it along. The motion passed. <laughs> yeah. Is there a vote? I never, everybody all in favor. Yeah. waiting for oh, the chair. It's, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. It, it was unanimous. Okay. <laughs> all right. And then the last item on the agenda is um, the, the um, garage sales. And mm -hmm. we had a discussion about that, and um, do we need to vote on this then? Yes. Okay. We do. So do we have any more discussion on the fact that the sign ordinance should take care of the garage sales? And No, I was comfortable with it because we, we went over that during right. the workshop. That we, we decided nothing needed to be nothing done, that the done. sign ordinance would probably be... Well, that together with the existing zone, zoning ordinance about um, excessive sales being commercial use of residential property, I think that combination really seemed to at least address it for now. Yeah. Okay, so shall we just vote on whether we say that we don't feel that there should be any limitation at this point that the sign ordinance takes care of the problem? Anybody Is want that to a motion we make? make a motion? It's more than the sign ordinance, though, is it? Hmm? It's more than the sign ordinance. Well, of. somebody want to make a motion correctly about? Well, well it's it's because it's really the business. You become a retail business if you. What's the ordinance say? All I was asking is for you to authorize that this memo accurately reflected what your position was, and if it doesn't accurately reflect your position, then it needs to be changed. It's my opinion it's that my it opinion. does. It reflects my opinion. Well, does, does the sign ordinance by itself do anything to limit the frequency of a yard sale? Or no, it does not. No, but there's a reference in this memo to the existing zoning ordinance that does limit excessive sales. Based on the position of the code enforcement Of the code officer. enforcement that officer. That becomes commercial, Jack, and then he can issue a violation because right. you're conducting a business in a residential area. Is that well enough to find that you think it provides the limitation that's des des desired here? I, after, after we had the meeting, I, I was doing some thinking about sort of excessive regulation, and I guess I'm looking at this as give it back to the code enforcement officer, let him enforce what we have, and if this just doesn't work, I have no trouble seeing it, you know, revisiting it. But at this stage, with those two ordinances, um, I just think we should sort of abstain from... from My only concern is that we, you might not know it's not working. Oh, I think you'll know. <laughs> no, no, because, oh. I mean, you know, let, let's say your neighbor has 11 yacht sales, you know. Mm -hmm. But, you know, your neighbor's a good friend, and as much as it's a nuisance, you know, you hesitate to complain. Then I'll call Beth so, and have her complain. Well. Right. I'll call Peter and have him complain. <laughs> you know what I'm getting at. Yeah, I, I no, do, I, I do I know, know what you're getting I'm not, I, I do appreciate the concern, and, and I, at first I was like, you know, this, this can be a real problem. I experienced it near my office. That's why I see it yeah. firsthand. But I'm thinking, you know, we need to just back off where where our own enforcement people, our own staff is saying, let me give me a shot at, at, at making the existing regulations work. And my bias is generally toward less regulation, not more, and, I, and at least at this stage. I agree with that. So I'm saying, yeah. for now, let's not regulate in this area. And if, you know, we come back in a year, um, you could write us a letter as a citizen and say that. But we have two known cases, I believe, in town. And, and, and I'm assuming those are going to get enforced. I'm assuming, but. Yep. Is that a good assumption? Well, we'll find out. Maureen, do you have any sense of? You know, code officer can't enforce things he doesn't know about. I mean, right. 
uh, I'll be honest with you. You know, if, if your neighbor is having 11 garage sales a year and he's such a good neighbor that you don't want to complain, then I guess it's not that big a problem. Yeah. yeah and if that's it is that, a big that enough a problem, position. you really need to call the code officer yeah. and tell him, um, you know, he's having 11 garage sales a year. And the code officer did say that um, that complaint was based on the fact that the owner was conducting a yard sale on the weekends on a regular basis. If an individual does the same thing next year, and he doesn't say this, and he knows about it, I believe the ordinance allows me to serve a notice, a violation notice for operating a retail sales business in a district that does not allow such an activity. And I think he will know about it because the citizen that brought it up is, I think, going to be fairly vigilant. And as far as the second one that was near me, that's not a good friend. I don't even know the people, and it's a pain. And I would let him know okay. immediately. Okay. Okay, everybody happy with the memo? Yes. We have a motion for Maureen to send the memo. It is so moved. Second. <laughs> All in favor? Okay. All right. Anybody else have any more business? I move to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Pushy, pushy, pushy. <laughs> we just can take a minute on the schedule.